Our final speaker is um, Siva Navachivam, who's a consultant uh, paediatric intensivist at the Royal Children's in Melbourne. Um, Siva has a wide range of um, both clinical and research interests. His, his work is primarily in cardiac uh, intensive care, but uh, and his research interests have ranged from uh, cardiovascular pathophysiology to long-term outcome, but and his uh, current major interest is in the um, uh, evaluating the role of, of peritoneal dialysis after uh, paediatric cardiac surgery. Siva. Thanks, Rob, for the introduction. Um, so this talk is going to be a very short talk, but I want to touch on a few themes here. Peritoneal dialysis is, um, uh, is a very old therapy, I would say, in pediatric cardiac surgery. If you look back at literature, you'd see publications uh, as old as 30, 35 years ago um, um, uh, in pediatric cardiac surgery literature. Um, so, uh, so I want to touch a little bit on the historical aspects of PD. The next thing is uh, uh, timing of initiation of PD uh, is something which I'm really interested in, so I'm going to concentrate uh, mainly on that. Uh, with regards to timing of initiation of PD, uh, we'll look at a couple of observational studies, um, one or two trials which have tried to address the question of timing, whether it matters in terms of uh, improving outcomes after cardiac surgery, um, and um, variations in practice. Uh, when I say variations in practice, it's nothing to do with the timing of initiation, but generally how units use PD across uh, uh, globally and more locally as well, and uh, what it all means, potential implications. Uh, so, so this is all about peritoneal dialysis just in pediatric cardiac surgery and uh, not in other disease states. So uh, dialysis has a long history, as I said before. If you look at literature, you'll see publications over the last 30 years, or maybe even longer. Uh, in fact, some of the major uh, reported uh, uh, publications come from Australia. Um, so this report in Texas uh, from a cardiac surgical group, 1997, but they used data uh, 10 years earlier, but reported in 1997, um, where people were really starting to put catheters routinely in theater for children having cardiac surgery. The main intention being at the time was to mainly remove fluid and um, uh, somehow modulate, uh, is what they're saying, the post bypass inflammatory response and improve outcomes. Um, so there's literature from Canada again in 1995, even though the papers in 1995, they've looked at over 10 years of data at the time. So it goes back to 1985, uh, sorry, 1985, 10 years before this publication that they were using PD uh, after congenital heart disease. And again from Germany. Um, and, and we know uh, in Australia, this, um, many of the centers have been using dialysis after cardiac surgery right from the early 80s or maybe even earlier. But most of these uh, papers which report dialysis report use of dialysis usually in the setting of acute kidney injury. So you have to develop acute kidney injury in the post-operative period and then dialysis was used. So either catheters were put in, in intensive care but some, or sometimes they had catheters coming from theater which were started or which were used once you developed a complication. But in some instances, uh, it, they were routinely used to remove fluid after cardiac surgery, after bypass, bypass inflammatory response. Um, studies assessing particularly the uh, question of timing of initiation of dialysis uh, are very few. Uh, if you search literature, there's so many studies which have reported dialysis use, but if you look about studies, particularly looking at the timing of initiation of treatment after cardiac surgery, when I say after cardiac surgery, I particularly mean the time of finish of bypass, um, and initiation of uh, dialysis, there are very few which have properly looked at it. Um, this is one of those studies, uh, which is more recent, uh, from France, um, from 2012, where it's an observational study looking at 140 neonates and infants after cardiac surgery. They all included all types of surgeries, including complex surgeries, 
and um, they compared early PD, which they defined as post-op day one. So if you have surgery today, today is day one, so you get PD today. And they compared that group uh, with a late PD group. They did a very good analysis. They used a propensity score model. Um, uh, they came up with a list of uh, covariates, uh, baseline uh, and intraoperative covariates, which they nicely balanced for, such as age, weight, sex, complexity of surgery, bypass and cross clamp duration, creatinine clearance at the time of initiation of PD, and use of ultrafiltration or not, and even use of ECMO in the first day. Um, uh, and when they looked at it, uh, there was a big difference in survival up to 90 days. So if you had early PD, uh, you had a big survival advantage. Uh, most of the attrition seems to happen in the first uh, 15 days, but, uh, but it does continue up till the first 90 days. Uh, so this is the first thing, is a, is a kaplan Maya curve, but when they did a more controlled analysis using the propensity score model, uh, it's a 46 or 47 percent relative decrease in 30-day mortality uh, and up to a 43 percent decrease in mortality, relative decrease in mortality uh, at 90 days um, in this study, which is a propensity score model, which is well conducted, but, but it's an observational study. So we um, did a similar, almost a similar study in Melbourne. Um, using data up there over four years again. Uh, during this period, there were 548 infants who had catheters inserted in theta, of whom half of them, roughly half of them, had PD commenced in ICU, 239. They were divided into early and late, early meaning commenced PD within six hours of finish of bypass, and anyone who was commenced PD after were called late PD. Similar um, model as a previous study using a propensity score model where in this model you use a decide on a number of baseline covariates which are going to be different between the two groups early and late and then you try to balance them out and then in a way you are starting off as if both the groups of new are new are balanced and then you go and do the analysis so, so that's the idea of doing a propensity score um, and the outcome in this study was one of uh, essentially major adverse events. You, you need to have one or more of cardiac arrest, chest opening, ECMO, or death within the first 90 days. So the reason for choosing six hours of by, six hours of bypass finish as the time for early PD was this: uh, if we look at uh, the time course of events after cardiopulmonary bypass, after pediatric cardiac surgery or any cardiac surgery, this is what happens. Um, the SERS response, which is a systemic inflammatory response, really peaks at around four to six hours. So this peak is based on um, uh, evaluations of interleukins and TNF-alpha and a whole host of other measures. They usually peak around six to eight hours. By 24, by 48 hours, they're usually down to uh, uh, pre-bypass values. So, uh, and we know from my experience that most adverse events happen, uh, low cardiac output or related adverse events happen within the nine, first nine to 12 hours or in the first night. Or, and most of the events are, almost 60 to 70 percent of the events are complete within the first 48 hours. When I say events, anything, whether it's cardiac arrest or chest opening or, or going on to ECMO. So they all seem to follow a, a, a time pattern. Um, so uh, if PD way to work, introducing major adverse events, uh, it would seem appropriate that you would want to start it before this inflammatory response actually starts. Uh, so you had to be early, if it works. So that's the idea of dividing them into early and late based on uh, the six hour mark. So these were the results from this observational study. Uh, so 56 children were started on early and 183 had late PD, so after six hours of finish of bypass. Um, there was imbalance in the groups. Um, uh, if we look at particularly the bypass time, the early PD seemed to have had um, a much longer bypass or cross clamp time, slightly elevated lactate. So why children get early PD? Why do they get late PD? It's very difficult to know. It was, to, a lot of it was, would have been clinician preference. Um, some of which would have been oliguria or nuria, but, but it is very difficult to know, but, but they had, some of them had early, some of them had late. So, so the balance, so as I said, the 
there was a lot of imbalance at baseline. So if you look at the third column, which is uh, how different the groups were uh, as observed. So you calculate a percentage standardized difference. Essentially, you look at the means or the values or proportions, if it is a uh, proportion measure, and see how different the groups were early and late. So for example, age, 24. So anything around 15 or less, you would take it as balanced. So 24 is heavily uh, imbalanced between the two groups, early and late. Um, similarly, bypass time was 47.5 standardized difference, so there's a big difference, and we can see that on the numbers, 178 minutes of bypass versus 160 minutes, and so was cross clamp time, and so was lactate. So by using this propensity score model, you go and you try to balance them out by doing multiple iterations of the same uh, two groups, and essentially you balance, and then you go and do the analysis after that. So you're trying to separate the study designed from the analysis, and when we do that, uh, so this is before using the propensity score, just by looking at the data as it is uh, after dividing them into early and late, uh, there seemed to be a big difference uh, in the composite major outcome, which is one or more of cardiac arrest, chest opening, ECMO, or death within 90 days. So 95% of the patients or infants in the early PD group were free of major adverse events uh, versus uh, 79%. So that was a big difference. But when it is plugged into the propensity score model uh, to see the relative risk in, uh, uh, in reduction uh, comparing early with late PD, um, there seemed to be a big reduction. So uh, the composite outcome, uh, which, was, which I explained before, uh, there was an 84% reduction if you had early PD for one of these events in the, within the first 90 days. And if you divide those events separately, cardiac arrest, chest opening, ECMO, or death, they all uh, seem to be heading in the same direction um, uh, in support of early PD. And when you separate the groups further, and you use only children who have had a bypass duration of more than 150 minutes, um, uh, if PD, early PD were to help children or some way it modulates bypass response, you might think then uh, that the response would be much uh, or, or more easily seen in the children who have long bypass, and that's how it appears, at least in this observational data. So in children who had, in, or in infants who had bypass time more than 150 minutes, um, there seemed to be a, uh, almost a 95% reduction relative risk uh, in the composite outcome um, and almost close to a 85% reduction in death uh, by being on early PD. Uh, the reason why the other three events, cardiac arrest, chest opening, and uh, requirement for ECMO don't have a value is because every child who had this event in this uh, group uh, had late PD, so you can't calculate a relative risk. So uh, at least observational evidence do seem to support, uh, if, if it is properly looked at in, uh, with a question of timing, uh, there are only mainly two studies which have looked at it properly, but they are observational studies, and they do have problems. I'll come to that later on. Um, but if we look at trials, uh, prospective trials, whether they have uh, uh, studied timing of peritoneal dialysis after cardiac surgery and outcome. Um, there are two trials which come close to, have, to, to answering the question. This one, which was recently published, um, did not particularly look at the timing of dialysis, but they compared peritoneal dialysis with furosemide. Uh, peritoneal dialysis, uh, but if we read the literature in this particular paper, PD was started within the first uh, post-operative day, so you can call it as early PD. Uh, it's a single center, um, tested PD, early PD versus furosemide, unblinded RCT. Um, uh, their main outcome was to see if it, uh, is PD is superior to furosemide in removing fluid. That's it. Um, what they found was um, uh, uh, in terms of reducing, the primary outcome was to see um, if PD was superior to furosemide in achieving negative balance, 
there wasn't particularly a big difference, but in terms of children who had 10% or more fluid overload, uh, PD seemed to have made a big difference. Early PD, uh, only 15% of children had a 10% uh, or more fluid overload. They also seemed to be uh, needing uh, less duration of ventilation and less stay in ICU. But this study was not particularly addressed to uh, study the issue of timing, but this is at least one RCT which comes close to have addressed it so far. So the authors concluded saying PD is safe and allows for superior fluid removal than other measures which are usually used in ICU. Um, there's another study which is, which I think it's important to mention this. There was an RCT which was started in Melbourne about 30 years ago, uh, studying early prophylactic PD with uh, no routine PD, um, which was an early PD study, but now got published. Uh, but uh, the data is there. Uh, if we look at it, it seemed to have made a, did make a difference at that time. For one reason or another, it never went for publication. But that was a totally different time period 30 years ago when um, the cardiac surgery, types of surgery and complexity are totally different. And we can see that even in this 160 uh, children, the bypass time was only 56 or 54 minutes. So it's a totally different cardiac uh, surgical population at that time. But, but there was some difference in ICU duration, 85 hours versus 105 hours in the no routine P PD group. Uh, so the observational evidence which I showed before, two studies, one is from Paris and one is from Melbourne, they all sound very impressive in that they seem to make a big difference, but we have to realize there are big problems with observational evidence. The simple thing is case selection is there or selection bias. We all report only what we see. So there's going to be a big group of children who had catheters. We never started on PD. We don't know what happened to them. So, uh, so it's something which we can't address in an observational setting, but that's one major hole in an observational study. And they're uh, always going to be unobserved or unaccounted confounding. Um, again, we can control for only what we see. So what else is going on? We don't know. Uh, many of these observational studies are single center studies. There's big variation. Uh, we know in uh, perioperative management, and there are several other anti-inflammatory therapies which are in use, and it varies between centers. So how do these affect uh, uh, outcomes? We don't know. And just moving away shortly from the question of timing, uh, I think it's important to highlight that there are big variations in this treatment. It's been there for a long, long time, but there are still big variations in how people use it. This is just one example. If you see the second and third column, uh, there's a center which has reported, not one center, it's a multi-center report from US. Uh, of multiple centers which perform cardiac surgery, close to 28,000 surgeries. And over a four-year period, um, the number of PD catheters inserted out of 28,000 surgeries was 558, so that's about 2%. Um, and in a single center, uh, which had performed during a four-year period of 2,000 surgeries, there were almost as many catheters inserted. So this shows a big variation in how uh, PD catheters are inserted and even used. So this is international and international comparison. But if you look at locally in uh, Australia, I've listed four centers here. Uh, Australian centers, major centers which uh, manage post-op cardiacs. Uh, there are big variations locally as well. So these are all neonates who had cardiac surgery, not the whole population, just neonates over 10 years. Um, the number of surgeries where anything more than 200 surgeries have included them. And again, center one had 47% of the children were started on dialysis, 24% in another center, 13 and 8. So even locally, I think we have big variations in how PD is used or even PD catheters are put in. So if PD does work, which it seems like at least in the observational setting, I think it probably could work because of few possible reasons. Um, there's some evidence to show that it could remove, it removes cytokines from the peritoneal space. Some of cytokines sweep into the peritoneal space after bypass and it potentially could remove that. Um, and it obviously removes excess body water. Uh, and the other proposed indirect pathway could be by removing these mediators, mediators and fluid, um, it sort of promotes early ideal conditions for recovery, uh, which just means it minimizes the need for further deterioration. Uh, 
So uh, I think it's important we know or we find a bit more about the timing of dialysis and outcomes after cardiac surgery. Um, uh, I don't think it has been studied properly, uh, particularly given it's a low-cost intervention and particularly also many um, uh, low- to middle-income countries uh, performing high-complex surgeries, and this is a very low-cost intervention. So um, I think the main take-on um, for me, uh, at least from this one, is uh, there's very limited uh, evidence um, or consensus uh, in, in regards to how peritoneal dialysis is used. There's huge variations between units. Uh, I think the question of timing is particularly important. Uh, at the least, we need to know whether timing matters in initiation, or even if it doesn't work, at least we will know. Um, RCTs in multiple settings are important both in high and low to middle income countries uh, could provide a very uh, important answer uh, of this low cost intervention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. I think we've got time for one question. ask a question <laughs> of, of the, um, the various comparators that you've quoted in the studies that you've quoted um, what do you think is the, the more important do you think it's uh, uh, comparing one time of uh, commencement of, of PD or do you think it's no PD um. It should be commencing the time of commencement, which is within, it should be, ideally it should start, if you're going to study, it should start soon after the child comes to ICU. Uh, and a comparator group should be uh, uh, no period at all, at least for a 24 hour period. Uh, because as much as we know, the inflammatory response peaks at about six to eight hours, but there's going to be big variations in that team. So if you want a really good comparator group, uh, you would want that group to not be on PD at least for 24 hours, unless if they meet um, uh, certain exclusions like uh, severe hyperkalemia or total anuria, you need to do something about it. Um, uh, if you really want to test the effect of timing of PD, I think you need to have a group where you don't start PD at all for, for 24 hours at least. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Johnny. So it's a bit hard to interpret that with any confidence in the, in the light of low mortality in, in current uh, cardiac surgery in our region. Um, have you any comments? I mean, that just looks extraordinarily good to me. What sort of patients were they operating on? They had a whole range of um, um, RACS 1 to RACS 6, so all complex patients. I think it is high... Because uh, uh, I think it is, uh, I think they have high mortality. But those numbers reflect uh, the mortality in the children who had PD. So it's not overall cardiac surgical mortality. So again, comes back to uh, case selection. So they report only those who had PD, and children who had PD are going to be the sicker ones. And so the denominator is not the whole unit's whole cardiac surgical population for that year or many years. So as a lead on from that, uh, do you believe that that's the way to use PD? I know you don't, but do you want to explain how you think PD should be used? How it should be used? Uh, don't know, how, which is why I think we need to study that. Um, uh, that's a big problem with observational evidence, which looks very convincing, but I think when you go into real uh, uh, life and test it prospectively, where you select a group of patients and everyone you decide whether they get PD or not and randomize, uh, you will see a lot of dilution of effects. Uh, but obviously all of these studies, if we are studying as we are studying, we, have, we started a trial, as we all know, um, should have a primary outcome as they have had, mortality and cardiac arrest and other things, but you must have a whole series of secondary outcomes as well. 
which may not be powered, but I think which will give very useful information. Secondary outcomes as simple as length of inclination and ICU stay and fluid balance and all of those things. So um, uh, if it is adequately powered study, um, I think, and if it works, if the timing works, and I think uh, all the ducks will line up, if it doesn't work, I think um, it will be very clear, it will be fairly clear. Thanks very much, Sandra. And, <clears throat> and um, again, could we thank all our uh, presenters for a really good presentation.